Hello, I'm Purnima Nair and I'm glad to be here at DDD East Midlands. It's my first in-person conference after nearly 20 months, so happy to see some faces in 3D. And thank you for having me at DDD East Midlands. A little bit about myself, I'm Purnima Nair, I'm a freelance.NET developer. I am based in Langley in Berkshire. Non-work me, I am a mother to a seven-year-old girl. I spend a lot of time reading and I'm also a student of Carnatic music, which is a stream of Indian classical music. This mic is a little bit flaky, so if, apologies if you can't hear me clearly. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP for developer technologies. I also do a lot of work with Umbraco, which is a .NET based open source CMS. And I've been an Umbraco MVP for the past three years. And that's my Twitter handle, should you wish to connect with me. So today's topic is about REST versus gRPC versus GraphQL. Um, I'm assuming that there are a lot of developers in the crowd here. And this is a constant point of debate among de developers. Which one is the best API style? GraphQL, REST, or gRPC? REST is rest in peace, GraphQL rocks. These are all Twitter debates that we've seen so often. But that's not the route I'm going to take today. I'm a mother. I'm a freelance.NET developer. I don't have time for a debate. Let's not debate about it. Let's compare. What can we do practically from these AP, A, three API styles? What are the basics of these three API styles? And at a practical aspect, how, do they, how similar are they and how do they differ? That is the point of my talk today. So let's learn about each of these API styles, the basics of it, and then go on to a comparison of how it all works. We are talking about API, and API is all about data as well reading data, getting data, getting information. So we need a data context. I'm a Harry Potter fan, so my data is all around Harry Potter characters today. What if we have a database of information about Harry Potter users? Let's see whether we can um, add a new user into the database. It's, uh, just plain, simple information, name, headline, basic information about some Harry Potter characters. Let's see whether we can update the de uh, details of the user, maybe delete the details of a user. And we'll go on from there and discuss how these API styles will cater into a change if we are then extending this platform or database into a fictitious social media platform for these, dev for these Harry Potter users. How will a uh, user post a comment? Or how will uh, someone read the story posted by a particular Harry Potter character? How will a user read some of the comments to a story posted by a Harry Potter character? That, will, that is what we'll discuss briefly today. Let's start with gRPC, uh, because when I finalized this talk, I thought it's probably the most easiest to start with gRPC, then go into REST, and then GraphQL from there. It was all kind of logical for me. So what is gRPC? It's a modern, open source, high performance, remote procedure call framework. So remote procedure call frameworks have been in existence since about 1970s, but gRPC is a flavor of RPC, or remote procedure call frameworks. And what is a remote procedure call framework? I'll let you read this definition. I'm assuming that everyone had a go at it. What remote procedure call frameworks does in a nutshell is you have a local program or a computer program which calls a function. And that function actually invokes a server function on a remote server. But the call from the client program to the server looks as if it was a local, local computer call or a local method call. That is what a remote procedure call means. As the name suggests, it's invoking a procedure which is remote over a call. But the system hides the, the location of the call. That location transparency is one of the key features of remote procedure call. So as I said, RPC frameworks were in existence in the 1970s, 
but the term remote procedure call was coined by Bruce J. Nelson in 1981. So the, the term came into existence around 1980s. So the fundamental f unit with RPC frameworks is functions. With RPC, you call a function on another server as though it was a local function. So that is what the essence of RPC is. And what exactly happens in a remote procedure call framework is you have a client and a server. There's a request and response happening. There's the client function, which calls a client stub. This client stub is like a little program which uh, is responsible for packing the parameters of the function call. And that procedure is called marshalling. It then passes the information over to the RPC runtime on the client which forwards it to the RPC runtime on the ser server, and that calls the server stub, which is responsible for unpacking those parameters. And that process is called unmarshalling. This finally then calls the server functions, which, which executes and re returns the response, and the response goes back the same way it came through to the server, all the way back to the client function. So it's method calls that's happening. And what is gRPC? What is the history of gRPC? It's, Google it's Google's implementation of remote procedure call framework. And it was initially called Project Stubby and was made open source um, and called gRPC in 2015. With .NET Core 3.0 onwards, it's officially supported. I'm a .NET developer, so I, I like to talk within the .NET realm. So it's a first class citizen with .NET Core onwards, 3.0 onwards. And gRPC favors contract-based API development, which means there's a contract somewhere, and as developers, we are implementing uh, or creating services that implements those contracts. And gRPC heavily relies on HTTP2 and takes advantages of various features of HTTP2, like a response request multiplexing, streaming, binary compression and um, framing, et cetera. With gRPC, it's important to talk about protocol buffers. Protocol buffers are Google's open source mechanism to serialize structured data. So they are language neutral, platform neutral, as well as extensible. So protocol buffers are, are the packets of information that is carried to and fro between the client and server in RPC frameworks, or gRPC. Data in protocol buffers is structured as messages. So that is an example of a message. You have the message keyword followed by the name of the message. In this case, it's a person reply. So it's some kind of reply or a response coming back from the server. And it's of the type person. It's not a, it's not a convention by any means. I've just used person reply in this instance. And each message is a record of key value pairs. So each message has fields, and each field has a type, for example, string or a bool. Each field has a name, and each field has a number. This number is quite important because protocol buffers are communicated or serialized in binary format. And while that serialization and deserialization happens, the field names and the values are matched upon the number. So this number is used for serialization and it's not the name of the field that's being used. So the number is important. So if you change the, the number or remove a field completely, you'll have to start think about, thinking about versioning strategies in RPC. So that's protocol buffers. And the next thing we need to speak about are protofiles. So as I said, our gRPC is contract-based API development, and the protofiles uh, define the contract of the API. So each protofile is a contract and it contains the definition of the gRPC service that you can implement using that service. And it also contains the messages that are passed between the client and the server. And how does a protofile look in reality? This is how it looks like. We have a syntax to begin with, which defines the syntax for the protofile. We have a C sharp namespace. We'll come to this shortly. We have the service definitions. So we have a service called greeter. That is the service uh, or, the con or this protofile defines a service called greeter. That's the contract. And that particular service has a procedure called say hello, which, which accepts a hello request. That's the input. 
and what you get back from the procedure is, a, is something of the type of hello reply. We also have the messages in the profile. So the hello request is what I give as an input to my procedure and what I get as an output from my procedure is hello reply. Going in a bit more further, I said there's a C sharp namespace and the service definition and a procedure. What happens behind the scene is Visual Studio has tooling to generate code automatically based on a profile. So every service that you see in a profile gets uh, converted or generates code behind the scenes into a service class of the convention service name dot service name appended by the word base. So in our case, the greeter service forms a C-sharp class of the type greeter.greeter base. It's an abstract partial C-sharp class. And each procedure in the service um, becomes a virtual C-sharp method in that abstract class. So which means you can define your own service implementations by overriding these methods. And what about the messages? Each of the messages in the proto file that you define gets converted into a C-sharp class, and each of the field gets um, written out as properties of the C-sharp class. So this is on the server side. We are talking about the server side code now. There's also code generated for the client side. So as I said, we have client stubs and server stubs in RPC frameworks. So the server stub has already been dealt with. This is the client side. So every service generates a client side stub as well and it generates a C-sharp class of greeter.greeter client, and it will have the stubs for the procedures in my service as well. And how is this code generation controlled? So there's a Visual Studio NuGet package called gRPC tools, which gets installed as a part of your gRPC service template in Visual Studio, and there are certain protobuf references. So you have to reference your proto file in your CS proj, and there's this attribute called gRPC services, and currently, it's set to server. So if it's set to server, the server side code just gets generated. For client side, client, the gRPC services attribute should be set to client. You can also set it to both or none. If it is set to both, both server side and client side code gets generated. If it is none, no code gets generated. This can be particularly useful if you want to have a collection or a large amount of profiles and that kind of uh, shared between client and the server side projects. So let's have a look at some code now. It's not going to be a here is how you can build it step by step. I have quickly laid out some example. I'll give you the link to the GitHub repo at the last so that you can figure out for yourself how to kind of build it from the scratch. But let's see what goes on underneath the hoods. So that's my solution. So I have the user.proto here. Where is my mouse? Hello, mouse. There we go. I'm still getting used to presenting in person. So that's my user.proto file. So this is the service that I've written for all the methods containing the CIUD operations around my users. So get all the users from my database. Get a particular user by the ID. Add a particular user, update a del uh, or delete a particular user. For each of that, I have got a method defined in my service called user. And what this does is, this is a server-side project that I'm showing you right now, and it's based on the gRPC, tem uh, gRPC template, the gRPC service template in Visual Studio, and the server-side code get getting generated, and each of these methods are generated as virtual methods in my server-side class. So, um, Alongside the methods, I also have the request and reply models. Let's have a look at the get users method in a bit more detail. So it accepts a user list request model, which is here. That's my message. It's empty. So one thing I figured about procedures in gRPC is that it requires an input no matter what. It can be an empty envelope, but it has to have that envelope and it returns a user list reply model. So with this get users method, what I am trying to get is a list of all the users in my database. And that is my message here. So it's a single envelope that can be returned back from a gRPC method. You cannot have multiple, multiple uh, things coming back or multiple things going in. It has to be a single envelope. 
So I have that single envelope here, and that message has a repeated field of user reply model, and the field name is called users. So it's like a nested, uh, nested message that I've got here, which I've defined here. So my user reply model is uh, something which contains an ID, a name, and a headline, and it's a repeated collection of this that gets returned in my user list reply model. And what happens behind the scene is, this gets generated into a C -sharp class, and so does this, but this will have a property called users, which will effectively be a list of user reply models. So what I'll get back is a list of user reply model. Now, how do I implement this? So I've got my user service here. As I said, it generates C -sharp classes on the server side, and that class will follow the naming convention service name dot service name base, which is what I've done here. So I can derive my class, service class, from that base class, override the method, and do whatever I want in that method. I'm not going to go into the entity, core, entity framework core aspect of this because I've got an in-memory database going on be behind the scenes. But it accepts a user li list request model, which is what my envelope of request is. And we also get a server call context by default with every service. This context object contains the context of the server, so you won't uh, to access any request headers or something which comes in as a part of the call, you can use the context to do so. And in that method, I can do all the processing, which I'm using my user's repository for getting the data out, and then return that data back at the end. So that is gRPC in a little bit of a nutshell for you. Now, what happens if you want to extend this further into the fictitious social media platform that I spoke about. What if I want to get the stories for a particular user, for a particular story by ID? Say we want the top user stories for a particular user, or we want the top comments for a particular story. We will have to write methods or functions and create services for that. So gRPC or RPC is very action-oriented. Do this, do that, get me this, get me that. It's all action-based. It's, it's very action-oriented. With gRPC, we also need to talk about the four gRPC methods very quickly. What we saw was unary method, in which you have a single input going in and a single output coming back. We have streaming methods as well with gRPC. And this heavily takes advantage of the HTTP2 feature of request and response multiplexing. So with server streaming, the client sends in a single request, but what you get back from the server is a stream of messages. We can also have client streaming, whereby the client sends in a stream of messages, and you get back a single response from the server. You can also have bidirectional streaming, wherein the client sends in a stream, and we get a stream back from the server as well. And if you're thinking metadata with uh, gRPC, you can have request headers. You can pass in the request headers and the context object, which I mentioned. You can have access to the request headers from the context object. You can also have response headers coming back from the server as a part of your response. Now, there's an additional functionality with gRPC, which is response trailers. So we have all the streaming capabilities with gRPC, so it'll be nice to have at the end of a streaming call saying how many messages have been returned, or if it was uh, something to do with processing and a failure, why that processing failed. That error response can go back as a response trailer. So it's additional metadata that you can get back. Unlike, unlike response headers, response trailers are served after or after the response has been complete. So once the server has completed processing, that is when response trailers come back to you onto the client. Now, for some advantages and disadvantages, where does gRPC win with its lightweight messages? Because it's binary formatting, the messages are very low in their size. It's high performant. There's built-in code generation. And of course, I'm a .NET developer, so I'd like to talk from a .NET perspective. There's built-in support. And of course, we can make use of the streaming options, which is quite a feature to gRPC at the moment. And where it kind of uh, lacks is the tight coupling between the client and the server. 
uh, there's a clients tab and the service tab, and it is all tightly coupled together. If you actually see a client program written for a gRPC service, you can actually see the client coupling. If anything happens on the server, the client has to be updated as well, otherwise it won't work. There's limited browser support because it relies heavily on HTTP2. So if you are looking at browser-based uh, apps like Blazor at the moment, you have to rely on to gRPC web, which acts as a proxy to, I think, convert HTTP1 0.1 messages into HTTP2 format. That's how I understood it. There's zero discoverability, except for the proto files. You have nothing as a source of reference. You can easily have function explosion with gRPC, because for everything, you need to write a function. There's no way of reusing something that you have already got. And of course, the binary format, it's not human readable. So that's gRPC in a nutshell, and let's move on to REST. REST is by far the most popular and probably the most mature API style on the internet, and it's widely used by the developers, widely adopted. But are we truly using REST is a question that I asked myself once I started prepping for this talk. It was an eye-opener for me, I would, I would say. REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it was first presented by Roy Fielding in 2000 in his famous dissertation. He suggested it as an architectural style for distributed hypermedia systems like the WWW. So you can say that REST was put in place to standardize WWW. And REST is based on six architectural constraints. The fundamental unit in REST is resources. A resource is anything that can be a thing in itself, like a, ta a table, uh, an employee, anything that can be a thing is a resource. And what REST says is, here are some resources. Go do whatever you want with it. You can talk about the collection of resources, relationship between resources. We are modeling resources in REST. Every resource has a resource identifier. And every resource has a representation. When we talk to a REST API, we are actually giving it a resource representation. And we are getting back a resource representation. And resource representation is made up of some data, plus metadata, plus hypermedia links. So this is what the data looks like. You have some data followed by some methods, some links in the JSON that comes back, and some metadata as a request or a response header as well. Now, the rest constraints. There are six constraints. The first one is client and server. The, so there's always a client-server model with REST, and the client asks for services, the server gives the services, and there can be any number of varied clients connected to a server. It is stateless, so which means that every request from the client to the server contains all the information that, it, that the server needs to process a particular request. It should not rely on anything that came before it or is about to come after it, which means any information about the session is stored on the client. The server doesn't manage that for you, or shouldn't manage that for you. The next constraint is cacheable. Caching is not a constraint. Cacheability is the constraint here. So which means that responses have, should have the ability to be, able, uh, to be marked as cacheable. So you should be able to mark a response as cacheable. And those responses which are marked as cacheable should be served for incoming equivalent re requests uh, from the client. And uniform interface, this is probably the most important constraint of them all. So this suggests that every resource in the system should have a uniform interface using which it, it can be identified. Resources can be represented in multiple formats. You can have XML, you can have JSON, all those sort of formats. And the response that comes back to you should have hypermedia links, um, which can then help the developer take action or understand more about how to use your API, how to use your resource, what more can you do with the resource, what are the related resource. So your API itself forms a kind of documentation for the party who is consuming or using it. The fifth one is layered system, which says that Rest, RESTful systems can be layered. Every layer can talk to a layer above or below it, 
and layered systems means you can actually replace or remove a layer. So these are the five compulsory constraints. As long as all these five constraints are kind of met for your system, you have a RESTful system in place. Finally, we have an optional constraint called code on demand, which says that you can have applets or executables served as a part of your RESTful system as well. So you can have little pieces of UI going back. That is also a part of RESTful system. Now, over the years, the definition of REST among developers have changed, and this is where it became an eye-opener for me. One of the myths that we have is that REST is serving JSON over HTTP. That is not REST. Just because you have a method serving JSON over HTTP doesn't mean you have a RESTful API in place. That's not REST. REST is all about those six constraints. Another one, REST is RESTful procedure calls. Nope, that's not REST. Very often we start off with the dream of having the best REST API in place, but soon, like, no, I'm not gonna do this. Let's just invoke methods over HTTP. It becomes a mixture of JSON over HTTP plus RPC, which gives rise to RESTful procedure calls. That's, again, not REST. The biggest of them all, REST equals HTTP, nope. REST is not equals uh, HTTP. REST is an architectural style for distributed hypermedia systems. And HTTP is a communication protocol. But Roy Fielding felt that many of the attributes of REST go hand in hand with HTTP. And so REST APIs are implemented using HTTP. And REST was put in place to standardize HTTP. And for that, for that reason, we have a reuse of the toolbox in HTTP in the RESTful APIs. So many of the constraints uh, or many of the toolbox items like content negotiation, caching, risk requests, response, headers, all of it is available for you to use in REST. So there's seamless integration with REST into HTTP. And what do you have with a REST HTTP? We have a root endpoint like this. And what should the root endpoint look like to you? Let's have a look. Let's run this. If I can find my mouse. There we go. Come on. OK, it's decided that it's. There we go. So what we have here is, uh, OK, in my root, root entry point, I get something of the sort of this. It says there's something called users, which lives at that location. It is a collection of some sort. And the description says, get all users. OK, let me traverse the link and see what happens. OK, I get to see a lot of users in my system. Each user has an ID, a name, and a headline. And then each user has a, link, uh, a list of links as well. It says self, click the link, and I get to see the details of this particular user. Ronald Weasley is a super aura. And I can get the information about Ronald Weasley here. I can put the information here. I can delete Ronald Weasley here. And I can get stories from Ronald Weasley here. No, I don't have any stories from Ronald Weasley. Let's go find a better user who has some stories. I know Harry Potter has some stories, so let's go find Harry Potter. There we go. Harry Potter has some stories. And again, in stories, it says, using this link, I can get a story. And using this link, I can get a comment. So this is how a REST endpoint should look like. This was an eye opener for me. So this is like going through a website, clicking through different links, understanding what's going on in your website. It's like a website, which is a collection of web pages. That is how a REST API should look like. I'm not sure whether this is the best REST API in place, but hey, this is an example of how it should look like to you. Moving on in our slides, as I said, we are reusing the HTTP toolbox from in REST. And we can think about HTTP verbs, Request responses and status codes with HTTP. So what if I'm to create, delete, get, and update a particular user? What would we do? 
To get a particular user or get a collection of users, I would use the get HTTP verb. Uh, I issue a get request, which means do something, but it is of a get type. That's on the endpoint or the URL slash users to get all the users or slash users slash an ID to get a particular user. It doesn't have a request body, get doesn't have a request body, and you, can, you will get a response body with get. And you will also get some metadata with get, which should be a 200 okay or a 404 not found if you are not getting any content. So that is verb, request response, and the status code, which is the metadata. Then you have the post, which again acts on the users. Note that it is on the collection, that is the users that it is acting upon. That can be used to create a user. It has a request body and has a response body, and what gets returned is 201 as a status code. And the newly created resource, that is a user, the URI of that, that newly created user, would be returned to you in the location header. Then you can have put, which acts on a single user, that is user slash ID. It will have a request body, but no response body. And what ideally, or as a best practice, should get returned is 200 OK or 204 no content. Or if you are taking the update ahead for further processing, 202 accepted, or a 409 conflict. And you can have a delete, again acting on a single user. It doesn't have a request body or a response body, and what should get returned in the status code is a 204 con no content or a 404 not found. So these are the basic toolbox items in a REST API. So let's have a look at a quick demo of the code. So it's already running. So it's all based on the Visual Studio Web API template. I have the user's controller here. I'm again using an entity core framework in memory database. I have a method here called getUsers, which uses HTTP get. And it does some work using the repository to return an OK status. This is for creating those hypermedia, those special links that you saw in the response. We'll come back to this a bit later on when I talk about Hatios. We again have a get user by ID, which accepts an ID for a particular user, again acts on an HTTP get. It returns an OK status. I'm not worrying about the 404 here because I know I have content, but in reality, you should cater in for 404s. And what if you don't have a user? Then we have the create user method, which accepts an HTTP post, and it's getting a create user DTO from the body, which would be the name and the headline, and it would go create the user for me. And using the created at action, I'm sending back a 201 created status code, and the newly created resource, its URI would be in the location header. Likewise, I have an update, which uses an HTTP put, and returns a no content if everything goes OK. And I've got some error checks here as well. If the user is not found or the IDs doesn't match, I return a bad request. If I don't find a user, I return a no, not found, which returns a 404. Then I have the HTTP delete method for the delete user accepting an ID. Again, I've got some error checking and returning a no content. So that is the basic four methods in REST with uh, my little database. Now, what if you want to extend the system again that I sh told you about earlier? What if you want to get stories for users or get the top 20 comments for a particular story? Would you resort to this method? Nope. That is, again, invoking RESTful. That's invoking remote procedure calls, not RESTful procedure calls. That is invoking re remote procedure calls over HTTP. That's not REST. And if in the situations like this, that is where a concept called Hatios comes in. So this is where all the special links that I showed you in the response that becomes useful. As a user of the REST API, what I should be able to do is traverse across all the links and find, my, find the way myself to come up with that user comments or story comments or the top 20 stories. So which means I have to do a lot of back and forth calls. That is how RESTful system is supposed to work. It will work in certain cases. It won't work in certain cases, but let's come to that later on. But Hatios is REST Nirvana. 
Hactios is the acronym for hypermedia as the engine of application state. And the purpose of Hatios is that as a consumer of the API, I should be able to go around your API, starting with the root entry point, and figure out myself what I can do with the resources, what resources are available, what are the, in, what are the relationship between resources, and what other related resources are there for a particular resource. That is what Hatios, in a nutshell, is. And this was defined as the, the glory of rest by Leonard Richardson in his Richardson maturity model, which measures the maturity of your RESTful API system. It's worth a read if you haven't read that. Uh, so I would highly recommend reading it. I have left a link in my resources to Martin Fowler's blog post about Hattios in detail. It's, it's again, very well worth a read. Hattios is not yet a standard. There are, there's just ways to implement it. There is no best practice or standard as such but HAL is suggested as the standard. And two media types, HAL XML and HAL JSON have been suggested as like a work in progress standard as well. Now, some disadvantages and advantages again. With REST, there's decoupling between the client and the server. Server and client can evolve at their own pace, can be deployed at their own pace. That should be REST. REST is scalable. It's reusing all the HTTP toolbox items, which means it is, it's got seamless integration with HTTP and there's superior browser support as well. And it is easy to consume. Any client which can issue an HTTP request and consume an HTTP response can consume a RESTful API. So uh, it's widely used, widely adopted. And where does it lose out on? Because of the reason I spoke about the back and forth calls happening between the client and server to figure out the data, it can get a lot chatty. And REST doesn't have a single spec. It's an architectural style which suggests this is how a RESTful, a RESTful system should be. It's not, a, not even a RESTful API, it's a RESTful system. It doesn't concern itself with the low-level implementation details. So developers across the world have resorted to best practices over the time to define or to come up with a RESTful system. And because of its chatty nature, we have big payloads in REST. Um, there's overfetching, underfetching, and N plus one problem. Overfetching and underfetching goes hand in hand because overfetching means I don't have the data that I need, so I get go get a lot of data. In that process, I use what I need, discard the rest, go again, get the data, and that goes on and on and on. So there's a lot of traffic going on. And underfetching means I don't have all the data at any point of time, say if I want the user plus their story plus the story comments, I cannot get all of that in a single call. I have to do multiple calls for that. So overfetching and underfetching is something that goes hand in hand. And we always have the n plus one problem with REST, which means to get n resources, you have to make n plus one calls. And these three problems are what led Facebook to come up with GraphQL. So GraphQL is regarded as one of the cool kids on the block when it comes to API. And GraphQL is a very, very different flavor of API because it's not a way of building API, it's a query language. So you have an API and, or a date or data, you are querying uh, your data, and that's what happens with GraphQL. So it's a query language for your APIs. There's a supporting runtime on the server. And the most important thing is that it deals with your existing data. It doesn't concern itself with where your data resides. It can be a REST API. It can be a GraphQL API. It can be a database somewhere, but it is all based on your existing data. The key with GraphQL is that you have types. You specify types. Everything is types in GraphQL. And with those types, we ask for specific fields. So you can have a person type with name and ID as a uh, field, and you ask for those fields on, on those types. So you have to ask to get what you want. And what you get from GraphQL is a single smart endpoint. And what that single smart endpoint does is it takes in queries and gives your data a shape. It builds the data output quite dynamically for you because 
You are writing queries. Queries can be anything. You decide what your query is. So GraphQL deals with building that data output for you. So if you visualize your data as a graph, GraphQL helps you extract parts of that data graph for you. And that's what GraphQL does. So in my example, so I I'm writing a query here. So it says course with an ID 1045. I'm asking for some fields, say ID, credits, title. Uh, I've got some enrollments, so course will have enrollments. Um, it might have a student. The student might have some fields. But what I get back is JSON in the shape that mirrors my query here. So the shape of the data that comes back is a mirror image of my query. So I, as a client, can define what I need. And what I'll get is exactly what I asked for. I won't get anything more than that or less than that. So if your REST API is going to the grocery shop, the pizza shop, and launder it one by one, GraphQL is a person in between me and those shops which says, hey, hold on. You can tell me where the location of the shops are. You can tell me uh, what you want from these shops. I'll go fetch them parallelly for you. So it's like a really smart person doing or helping me out with my tasks. So that's why I've put in here, the client specify the shape of the data that they need, and the server responds back with data in the exact same shape as the query. And for that reason, the, the root or the fundamental unit is query in GraphQL. So some of the features of GraphQL, it's strongly typed, it's a specification, it's introspective, it's hierarchical. It's JSON response that mirrors the query that gets back. It's an application layer. It's version free and it's transport layer agnostic. With GraphQL type system, we need to talk about, uh, with GraphQL, GraphQL type system is something that we need to talk about. And we also need to talk about GraphQL schema. So at the heart of any GraphQL server or an API is something called the type system. And as I said, GraphQL is a specification. And for that reason, it's a standard. And we need a language agnostic way of talking about that specification. And GraphQL has come up with this schema language, which helps you define the schema. And what is a schema? What does it look like? Schema is made of types. The first one is the object type, which is a representation of your object. The second one is queries, which is to get the data. The third one is mutations, which is a GraphQL type again to insert, update, or delete data. And subscriptions for the pushed updates. So with GraphQL, we get this nice pushed updates as well. So your object, your domain entities are types, as well as what GraphQL tells you, the facility to add or update or get data, again, those are types. And these makes up the types in GraphQL schema. And each type is made up of fields, which has a name, a scalar or a type, or a complex type, that is the data type behind the field, and resolvers, which tells it how to resolve it to a concrete data. And this is how a GraphQL type will look like in GraphQL schema definition language. You have the type followed by the fields, the the field names and the field data types as well. A quick look at the three GraphQL root types. The first one is query, is the one of the operation types in GraphQL to read data, is the root entry point to read data. And you get or fetch the data using a post operation. So we build GraphQL APIs normally in HTTP, and unlike REST where we use HTTP get to read data, this happens over a post. And the keyword here is query, and what we get back is a hierarchical JSON response, which mirrors the query. It's time for a change, and we have mutations, which is for updating, inserting, or delete data. Anything that involves a change or a mutation is a mutation. Again, happens over an HTTP post. The keyword here is mutation, and it accepts a type called input type as an argument. We also have the subscriptions, which is updates which is for pushed updates from the client. So unlike the client polling the server, it's the server which pushes the updates back to the client. Clients can choose to listen if they want. Not all clients need to subscribe, but they can choose to. It works over WebSockets, again over HTTP post, and the keyword is the subscription here. 
and subscriptions are stateful. So server keeps an idea of the state to understand what updates need to be pushed out. With .NET Core, there is no inbuilt support for GraphQL. We are reliant on third-party packages, which is why I have got the slide in here for, uh, for the third-party packages. We have two known implementations of GraphQL in .NET, which is GraphQL.NET and Hot Chocolate. We also have clients to query the data, which helps you send strongly typed, uh, which helps you send query and gets you, lets you uh, get back response in a strongly typed manner. For that, you have GraphQL.NET client and Strawberry Shake. And what happens to the operations or the ways to read uh, or write data? We have types and fields again. So your type, object type user would be a type in itself and it would have ID, name, and headline as the fields. There's a query type again in the GraphQL um, and it would have fields to read data. So there would be a users field to get all the user data user to get a particular user by its ID. The main difference here is that it's not operations, it's fields in the query operation. With the mutation, you have three fields, create user, update user, and delete user. And with subscription, you can have a subscription or an update getting pushed out with user added, user updated, or user deleted. Let's have a look at the code demo now. So I'm using hot chocolate as a NuGet package here. And let's have a quick look at the query type. I've got two methods in here, get users and get user. So my social DB query type is my root query type. It's got two fields, get users and get user. And the field name is a bit of convention here. What hot chocolate does is if you have a, a, a field name or a method with get preceding the method name, what comes after the word get becomes the actual field name itself. So in this case, you would have a query called, uh, you'd have a query and a field called users. And in this case, you would have a field called user, which accepts an ID. And I can take the ID from there, pass it onto my repository and get the details out. Similarly, with the mutation type, I have three fields here, create user, update user, and delete user. In this case, the, message, the method names that I put in here are the field names. It's a bit of convention uh, that it follows with hot chocolate. Again, I can do my task in there. With subscription type, I have a subscription or a message getting out every time a user is added, and there's a bit of wiring up going on in here which sends a subscription, a uh, kind of message to the subscription that, hey, this is a action that's been done when the user is added. Now go trigger that subscription. I'm not gonna go in further details because this is a topic to talk about in itself, getting started with Gra GraphQL in uh, .NET Core. So I'm gonna stop my demo here, but I hope you have got a flavor. Now, what happens if I'm to extend it to get all the data about a user story and the comments about a story? I would write a complex query of some sort like this. For a, starting with the user, I ask for the ID name headline, then I can go ahead, get the stories, get the story details, and for the story details, I can get the comments, and for each comment, I can get ID, comment, text, etc. I haven't implemented this in my solution, but this is how it can work if you implement this in the solution. Now, again, some advantages and disadvantages. We have exact fetching with GraphQL. There's loose coupling between client and server. With GraphQL, we have auto-generating API documentation. So as I said, GraphQL is introspective. It can query itself. And this has led to a lot of browser-based ID tools like GraphQL or Banana Cake Pop or uh, GraphQL Playground, all of which can be used to test your queries, see your data in real time. It's something like Postman, if you have used Postman for REST APIs. And finally, GraphQL is version free. Uh, it doesn't have a concept of versioning because clients are always in control of what they ask for with GraphQL. With uh, GraphQL, the disadvantage is caching complexity. Because everything happens over HTTP posts, there's a very custom caching to be implemented for GraphQL. File uploading can become a bit nasty because of the huge payload size. Uh, 
with complex queries, performance can suffer, uh, and it's a bit of learning curve. It's a, it's a totally different style of API, and it took me a while to understand what GraphQL is all about, and I still don't think I've got it. And it's still a product in its early days, despite five, six years old, I feel, and the community is still growing for GraphQL. Finally, how these three API styles compare. I'm gonna quickly go through some of the details. With REST, the fundamental unit is resource, GraphQL is query, and gRPC is function. There's low coupling between the client and server with GraphQL and REST, while as with gRPC, there's a very tight coupling. REST is high in chattiness, um, low, uh, <laughs> GraphQL is low with chattiness, and gRPC, I would say, medium. With REST, we can make use of the HTTP caching the toolbox from HTTP for caching, while as with gRPC and GraphQL, it's very custom. Discoverability, provided you have Hattios, it's very good with REST, while as with GraphQL and gRPC, it is not as good. Uh, sorry, GraphQL is good with discoverability because it's introspective. With gRPC, you have to have tons of documentation. There's no discoverability whatsoever. <laughs> Versioning, REST and gRPC will need some versioning going ahead for backward compatibility for your apps and clients. With GraphQL, versioning won't be needed unless and until you decide to remove a field altogether which a particular client is using. With performance, gRPC and REST is fine. With GraphQL, it can suffer on complex queries. Payload size, again, heavy with REST, medium with GraphQL lightweight with gRPC because of binary format. Payload format, I'm keeping it to JSON in REST for now. We can have XML as well. JSON in GraphQL and binary format in gRPC. Browser support is superior for REST in GraphQL, while as with gRPC, it requires something like gRPC web. Uh, REST is only best practices, while as with GraphQL and gRPC, we have a formal spec. REST is mature as a product, while gRPC and GraphQL is still in its early days. GraphQL has the highest learning curve, and while REST has the maximum number of resources. Finally, I had to have this slide in for .NET support, because I'm a .NET developer. There's out of the box .NET support for REST and gRPC, while with GraphQL we are reliant on third party implementations because it is a, uh, it is a specification. With Visual Studio, there's out of, out of the box templates for REST and gRPC, again third party with GraphQL. Finally, when it comes to Azure hosting, REST and GraphQL can be hosted on app service and Azure functions. While as with gRPC, you have to stick to Azure Kubernetes service, or you have to create a gRPC web-based app using app service and put it on an app service. What are the tools available? We have Swagger UI, Postman, or Command Line to test REST. Graphical, GraphQL Playground, Insomnia, or Banana Cake Pop for GraphQL. GRPC curl, GRPC UI, or Bloom RPC, uh, again, which is based on Postman for GRPC testing. And some use cases. What are the use cases? If you have management APIs, which focuses on objects or resources, REST can be a good choice. Where you have varied client usage, REST can be a good choice. Microservices, REST is a good candidate. With GraphQL, it is designed for mobile APIs where data is like a graph or relational. It can be really good. If you want to fetch or aggregate data from multiple APIs, again, GraphQL can come into help. Something like a gateway or something called schema stitching can help in here. With gRPC, it's heavy uh, action-oriented APIs and it can work very well with internal services. It can work well with microservices. I heard it can work well with IoT. In fact, protocol buffers is something that I came across when I was developing something for Google Home and playing around with it as well. And gRPC can work well for polyglot environments as well. So that's gRPC, GraphQL, and REST in a nutshell for you. I hope you have learned something from my talk today. That's a short link to all the resources that I've gathered for the day. I can tweet this link out later in the day. And thank you for having me at DDD East Midlands. Have a good rest of the day.